Well, good morning, everyone. Been washed by the blood. Listen, so when you hear songs that speak of the blood of Jesus, it is that what allows us as believers to be united because you, it's impossible to be a Christian without being covered by the blood of Jesus. And in today's time, it is great to hear a song or a message or a devotion or uh, any reference to the blood of Jesus because oftentimes now it is something that is not mentioned. But if it was not for the blood of Jesus, there would be no need for us to gather for we truly could not exalt our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you all for being here uh, this morning. Uh, really, really uh, excited about the opportunity that we have to journey through the word. Uh, on yesterday, uh, my wife and I, we were in Rome, Georgia, and uh, for this past weekend, starting Wednesday, there has been a big um, conference, D now, with students uh, there, and about uh, 19 churches gathered with all of their students, and I was one of the uh, speakers, but I just want to share with you that 19 people accepted Christ uh, yesterday, and, and you know how important that is to our church because uh, we say week after week, it is more important that someone who visits at Annistown would accept Jesus Christ than if they became a member of the church. It's not that we do not want you to become a member of the church because we definitely want you to become a member of the church, but our first priority for someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ is to introduce them to Jesus Christ because there's no greater satisfaction uh, to another believer, but more importantly of all, there's nothing that brings God greater joy than seeing someone who was once lost and he's been reaching for that accepts the great gift of his son, Jesus Christ, that accepts eternal life. That brings great joy to God because now that person can begin to fulfill the purpose that God originally intended. And so we are excited when we see someone come to Christ. We also want to take into account before we start this morning, uh, I would like for us to, as a church to pray for those in our congregation or who are uh, connected to someone in our congregation who is sick or who has experienced a uh, injury. I know that there has been several uh, automobile accidents. I know that uh, one of our members, Angel, she was involved in an uh, accident. I know that Kay's daughter was involved in an accident. I heard John Miller was involved in an accident. And there may be many more, but we want to pray for those who are sick, those who have been uh, injured, that God would restore them physically, give them all of their physical abilities uh, back, but even more so that they would utilize their strengths, their abilities to continue to honor and glorify God. So as a church, let us set aside the time to pray for others. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you so much, Lord for the opportunity to talk to you, to hear from you. And we come before you this morning, Lord, praying for those who are sick, whether it be from uh, cancer, whether it be from diabetes, whether it be, Father, from high blood pressure, whatever the sickness may be, it may be a cold, it may be a flu. But, Lord, you know their body even better than they do. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would heal them, do what medicine can not do. Do, Father, what the doctors cannot do or may not be able to find. We pray, Father, that you would show yourself as you are the healer. So, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would heal their bodies, make them whole. And, Lord, we pray, Father, also for those who have been involved in accidents or who have been injured in any form or fashion, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would restore their body, heal them, make them whole, Father, from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you would give them confidence in mind, confidence in that heart, that you can and that you will, Father, make them whole, that you would restore them, not only physically, but you also, Father, even do greater things on the spiritual level. So Lord, bless it and make it so. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. So as a church, one of the things that we say we are about 
And we are about evangelizing, we are about, which is sharing the gospel, we're, we're about sharing the gospel, we are about seeing people grow in their faith, we're also about prayer, and we're also about just loving on people. And the, the greatest demonstration that a believer can make that they are in a relationship with Christ, a proper relationship, a growing, healthy relationship, is by the way that they love others. And uh, there's no greater evidence that you as a believer and I can, as a believer, could give to someone else that we actually know Jesus Christ and are in love with Jesus Christ and that we are obedient to Jesus Christ as a church. And when I say as a church, uh, we're going to talk about a little bit more. We have this responsibility thrust upon us to do. It doesn't matter if the, other, uh, if the world's not doing it. There's a responsibility that rests and lies upon you and I. And so we're going to look at some of these things today, but I would like for you to take your Bibles. Um, you may have a Bible app on your phone. Uh, feel free to use that. And if you don't mind, if you would hold them up, and uh, repeat after me. This is my Bible, the Word of God. And inside, God tells me the plans He has for my life. He tells me how much He loves me, even when this world tells me that I'm not lovable. And I shall be all that God desires for me to be because His Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. And this I proclaim in Jesus' name. Amen. Ooh, now listen, I'm excited. We're about to go into the book of Romans chapter 12. I'm so excited that we get to journey as a church through the word of God because it's in the word of God that we get to come face to face with the God of the universe and we can discover more about his heart, his plans, his intentions for us as individuals and as a church body. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 and we're going to focus today on uh, a few specific verses, verses 3 through 8, but to see it in this context, we're going to read verses 1 through 8 but we're going to focus upon verses 3 through 8. And here it says, Romans chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have uh, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you open our minds, open our hearts, so that we can discover more, but not only discover, Lord, that we may embrace. And what we embrace, we pray, Father, that we would apply so that it would not only be beneficial to us, but be beneficial to any and all those that we meet and those that we pray for. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to talk for uh, a short uh, a amount of time on, well, I guess some people say it's your perspective of short, because preacher, you ain't been short yet, uh, but uh, renewing our purpose in Jesus. Uh, and that, there is 
a great responsibility thrust upon us. And so Paul begins this particular text by saying in verses 1 through 2 that he's actually urging us, he's pleading with us uh, by the mercies of God, none other, uh, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, he's asking us to do what he says is just a reasonable thing to do because oftentimes we forget where we have come from. And if you forget where you come from, it's hard to appreciate where you are. In fact, not only will you not appreciate where you are when you forget where you came from, but sometimes you will experience highs and lows that are really unnecessary. Well, he says the most reasonable thing a person can do who has accepted Christ, is to offer themselves as a living sacrifice, willing, yielding to God. It's it's just reasonable. Think about it. At one time, you and I were lost. But because of Jesus Christ, we have been found. On top of that, not only were we lost, but we were doomed. Each and every last one of us was destined Uh, without Christ interrupting, without us accepting Christ, we were scheduled to go to hell. Because we were all shaped in iniquity. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short. No one in here can claim that they do have not sinned. No one in here can claim that they have never sinned. In fact, if you claim either one of those things, you're sinning now. Some say, well, I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't do, well, you're lying to yourself. Sometimes our biggest problem is that we don't recognize we have problems. Well, he is saying because we were born with the problem, we inherited it from Adam. Sin was imputed to us. We were shaped in iniquity. And when Adam sinned, it was as if you sinned because Adam represents mankind. And since you and I have been here, just think about a little child, a two-year-old. If you don't teach a two-year-old to do the right thing, the two-year-old is going to do the wrong thing. You don't have to teach a child to talk back to you. Just don't teach the child to do the right thing, to talk, to say the right thing, and to respect the right person. And they will do what is sinful naturally. They will talk back. They will disrespect. You don't have to teach a child. Think about it. I've never seen a parent say, listen, child, let me show you how to get upset and stump your feet. You You don't have to do that. You don't have to teach a child how to throw a tantrum. They learn how to throw a tantrum on their own. And listen, it's not just two-year-olds that throw tantrums. I have seen 62-year-olds throw tantrums. They may not fall out on the floor, but they throw a tantrum. You don't have to teach people how to sin. You don't have to teach someone how to curse. You don't have to teach someone how to talk about someone. You don't have to teach someone how to gossip, someone how to lie. You don't have to teach someone how to steal. These things just seem to come naturally. And because of these things, we all were destiny, doomed, headed towards hell. But because God's love towards you and I, not our love towards him, because God loved you and I, even at our worst, even at our broken down state, God says, I love you and I love you so much that I have given my only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. It's not because you and I bring something to the table. It's because of his love. His love is the motive behind of it, all of it. And because of his love, Jesus Christ was offered up on that cross for you and I. It's because of his love that he allowed man, creation, God's creation, to bury the creator. But the creator got up on the third day. And because of his love, because he died, because he was buried, because he rose from the grave, you and I also have the opportunity to life. 
Jesus Christ is the bridge that brings us into a relationship with God. Not just relationship-wise, but fellowship-wise. And Paul is saying here, the most reasonable thing you can do for someone who rescued you and I from our destiny is to actually yield to him. Sometimes we forget the dangers if we were not in a relationship with Christ. See, some people think I've experienced something harsh or hard in my life. I'm telling you the most difficult challenge that you have ever experienced in life the toughest thing that you may have gone through. Some of you may have experienced being homeless for many years. Some of you have been told about an incurable disease. Some of you suffer with chronic pain. Some of you have suffered great financial loss. Some of you have suffered from fi uh, families being broken up. Whatever you may have experienced, you may have experienced some type of abuse, whether it's emotional, sexual. I'm telling you the worst things that you may have experienced the worst things that you know of, none of them come up even close if to, to, to one that if one is separated from God and is in hell. There is no undoing when someone goes to hell. Some of you may be saying, well, preacher, you're just trying to scare me. No, I'm just trying to be honest with you. See, we're just passing through on this earth. And we all have an opportunity while we're here to accept Christ or not. Now, by not accepting Christ, by default, you have already dismissed him, rejected him. There's nowhere to go but to go to heaven or to hell. And I know that some people like to teach God so loving, there's no way he would send someone to hell. He is so loving that the worst thing that he would do to someone who did not accept Jesus Christ is that my body would just break down and turn back to ashes of dirt because he's just too loving. You must have skipped the part in the Bible where it says God is also just. He's a just God. He's a loving God. And because he's so loving, he's giving us the opportunity to enter into a relationship with him, the thing that you and I should do, how we should respond, is by yielding to him in service. And, and, and Paul's going to go really far with this, but he says, yield to him and be willing to be transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let the Holy Spirit do a great work in you so that your and my mind frame, your and my perspective, your and my actions would actually change. And he warns us, do not be conformed to this world. See, there's God at work and there's the world at work. God is working to do a great transformation in you and I, and the world is working to do a great confirmation. It's trying to conform us. Conform us. That's why every time you turn to media, if you turn to a book, to a magazine, if you turn to social media, someone's trying to shape you. Someone's trying to tell our young men how this is how you're supposed to be. This is how you get ladies, not a lady. It's the reason why a young lady, sometimes she's torn apart. She doesn't feel good about who she is in Christ or feel good about the person that God made her because the world has said your hair is supposed to be like this. Your hair is supposed to be this length. Your hair is supposed to be this texture. All that kind of, listen, the world is steady trying to shape you. It's trying to tell you what your shape is supposed to be like, how you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to talk, all of those things. The world is working to conform you and I. And if you don't act like the world, the world says you don't fit in. And we get frustrated with it because part of our flesh says, I want to fit in. And we're so uh, steady trying to work and find our place and our space in the world and we get frustrated about it because we discover there's no place for me. There's no space for me. I don't seem to fit in. Well, good. You and I weren't designed to fit in. We were created to stand out. That's what he means by being transformed. You and I were created to stand out. And because you and I were created to stand out, what we have to do now is be willing to stand up. You weren't supposed to fit in. Young people, at your school, you may try to, listen, you may try hard to fit in with the group. 
They may ostracize you, cast you to the side. Don't work so hard to fit in. Be the person that God has called you to be. He will attract what is supposed to be around you, who is supposed to be around you. But in that school that you're in, whether you're in middle school or whether you're in high school, you're there for a time period to actually help shape the school. If you're in high school, you have four years. If you've done it right, you did it in four years to shape that school, to make that impact in that school, in your workplace, the position that you are in. You are, the, you are there to actually shape that place. Now, some people may wonder when they go to work. Some people wonder when they go to school, why am I here? God has strategically placed you where you are to make an impact. Did you realize that even the doctor that you go to, the doctor's office, the hospital, the store that you visit, that God has allowed that for the time period that you're there to be the platform that you would exalt him? And some of us wonder, why can't I get this raise? Why can't I get, I mean, this promotion? Why can't I be moved to here? Well, sometimes it's because until we click and do what we're supposed to do on that current platform, you cannot move. It's almost like don't pass, go. Be faithful where you are. Make the impact where you are. But you have to be willing to be transformed and not conformed by the world. If you fit in with the world, the best you're going to be is like somebody you're trying to be like. See, if, if, if all you want to be is someone, a football player that you know or singer that you know or a lawyer that you know or the doctor you know, all you can be at best is the second best. But you can be the best you. But you have to be willing to be transformed. This is where Paul is going. It's, it's, it's really, listen, the points here are going to be simple. One, think about the first verse he says. For through the grace, in verse 3, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to having sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And what Paul is saying is think correctly about ourselves. We need to think correctly about ourselves. Oftentimes we have the wrong view of ourselves. Sometimes we don't see the reality of ourselves. And so he says, here's what we need to do. We need to look at this thing with humility. Be humble. Don't get the big head. Don't put your nose in the air. Be humble. Being humble has to do with this. It's not thinking less of yourself uh, when it's in comparison to others, nor does it mean having a low opinion of your own gifts. It actually means freedom from thinking about yourself one way or the other at all. It's, it's about being humble, humbling yourself. And um, in fact, did you all hear the minister who said he had a great sermon on humility, but he was waiting for a larger crowd to preach it? It, it's, it's about being humble. It's not that I think any less, that, that I'm any less than you. I think of you and I in the same regard. I don't think any one way or the word about it at all. Why I'm free, I'm free. I've gotten over myself. Some of us need to get over ourselves. Seriously, get over ourselves because really all honor should go to God. He is saying, and, and think about this, he's sharing this with believers. He is telling believers, get over yourself. Have a humble opinion about your place and your space in the body. Because it's easy sometimes as Christians, we sometimes look down upon humanity. And we oftentimes look down upon each other in the church. But here's where he's going to show us. We have so many similarities that it's no need, no reason for us to get high and hotty about ourselves. See, there are some similarities. See, one of the similarities that we all have is that we all have been created in the image of God. Not just believers, but even the unsaved have been created in the image of God, meaning that when God created man, he gave man a will, emotion, and he gave man intellect. 
And man was created. He had a body at first, but until God breathed life into him, he was just a body. God breathed into man. Man then had a soul slash spirit, and that is what we all have a nephish. And so man became a living creature. And that's why I always try to say that we are not a body with a soul and a spirit. We are a soul and spirit with the body. Because even when the body has broken down, the soul and the spirit, one of them, listen, it's going to heaven or it's going to hell. We are all on the same plane, level. It's a level plane. We all have been created in the image of God. So there's no need for someone to look down on someone else because we've all been created in the image of God. But not only have we all been created in the image of God, but every believer, if you are a child of God, let's, let's, let's go down the list. If you say I'm a child of God, if you say I'm saved, if you say I'm a believer, if you say I'm a Christian, if you say I'm a Jesus follower, they all mean the same thing. This is someone who has been covered by the blood of Jesus no matter which terminology you use. But here's another common thread. Not only are we all covered by the blood of Jesus, but one cannot be a believer, one cannot be a Jesus follower, one cannot be a disciple, one cannot be any of these things if the Holy Spirit is not indwelt with inside this person. Every believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It is evidence and proof that you and I are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you and I have been indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't act like at times that we are actually filled with the Holy Spirit. See, when you see another believer, if you see a believer cursing out someone, it does not mean that they're not saved. It does not mean that they're not a disciple. This just means that they're not filled with the Holy Spirit right now. Now, they might be filled with a lot of things. Now, the Holy Spirit still indwells them. And so, it's no different just because I may go, I may travel to Africa. When I'm in Africa, it does not mean I'm not in a relationship with my wife. That she may not be, but his, the Holy Spirit work is work, uh, uh, greater than that though. Because when I'm in Africa, she's back here. But wherever I go, the Holy Spirit is with me. So if I'm at church, the Holy Spirit is in me. When I go on the streets to witness, the Holy Spirit is with me. But also if I went to a bar and I sat there and I spent time with Jack on the left, Jack Daniels, and Johnny on the right, Johnny Walker, and if I spent time with Jack and Johnny, guess what? The Holy Spirit is there too. So it's really not three people, it's four people there. If a man who is in a relationship with Christ, he's saved, and he has an affair on his wife, guess what he just did? He just went and sinned, and he grieved the Holy Spirit because you went into a sinful situation, you're sinning, and you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Y'all got quiet, but that's all right. He, the, the, the Holy Spirit is, is, is a common denominator for all Christians, we all are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Here's another thing we have in common. We all, all fit in God's plans. See, every person is a part of God's plan. Every, listen, hear me out. God has a plan for your life, even if you don't know the plan. That's why I always go back to Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans of what? Peace, prosperity, not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. It didn't say that you and I know the plan. I know it's frustrating at times because we all want to know the plan for our life. We want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We want to know what's going to happen in an hour. We want to know how is this going to turn out? How is this going to happen? It never said that I know the plan and I'm going to give you the whole plan. Nor does it say that I and Joe know the plan. It doesn't say that. Nor does he say I want to give you the plan book. What it says is I know the plan. God has the plan. And I, I, I encourage you always to do this. You don't have to have the plan book to have confidence about your life. You do not, if this was a plan book with your name on it, you do not have to have this plan book to feel confident. 
There's something greater that you can have. It's actually not a something, it's a someone. Instead of reaching and striving for the plan book, strive for the planner who actually has the plan book. If you have the planner, you have something even greater than just the plan that he holds, but you also have the planner's provision for the plan to come to pass. You also have the planner's protection for the plan to come to pass. You don't need the plan book. What we need is the planner. God has a plan for every believer. It's the common ground. We should just humble ourselves, see our similarities, and that should help us to understand, guess what? I'm not all that. Look at the, the, the remaining verses, four. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. I'm going to stop there. It's not that we should not only think correctly about ourselves, but we should also think correctly when it comes to others. See, there are some things here that we, 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 we can quickly pick up. One is we all belong to one church. I know you came on this parking lot this morning. I pulled in the parking lot. We all came through these doors and we said we we're at Annistown. But down the road, you have Mountain Park. Up the road, you have another church. Around the corner, I mean, that's churches around. Do you realize that all of us are one church? As long as they believe in those first-tier doctrinal things. In other words, in, in fact, I was sharing with someone, they said, well, hold up, that's, every church is not a church because they don't do this, 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 this. Well, if they don't do those things, they're not a church anyway. See, if, if one does not believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, and that Jesus Christ died on the cross, or that he was buried, that he rose from the grave. If they do not believe that in order for a person to be saved, they have to accept Jesus Christ, uh, that they have to be covered by the blood of Jesus, that one is indwelt with the whole. If they don't believe certain basic things, that's, guess what? It's not a church anyway. Yeah, they might walk in, in the building with a Bible in their hand. But there are some bare basics that allow all churches to have common ground. We may differ on certain things, like do you have pews or do you have chairs? Do we sing a hymn or do we not sing a hymn? Do we use guitars or do we not use guitars? You can argue and debate on all of those things. And those things are not even second, third, fourth, or fifth tier things, okay? But there are some things that are doctrinally, theology-wise, that must come to pass. They must be ascribed to the Bible. One has to even believe that man is in a fallen state. If a man doesn't even see that he's in a fallen state, he won't even see that there's a need for salvation in the first place. That's some systematic theology issues that one can look at to understand and find the common ground for churches. We're all of one church. That should be encouraging to us because even as you look around the room, you may see a face that you don't recognize and you may discover that that person knows Jesus and that person's in a relationship with Jesus. Well, you just found someone else who's part of the church. It does not matter even if we all don't speak English. We, may, we all may speak different languages. We may have different uh, uh, ethnicities. We may have different races. I told the, uh, yesterday, yesterday, the conference we were doing, my friend Mauricio, he spoke. He's um, uh, Latino. And he came up, he said, I'm the brown brother. And he did his, you know, he, he shared. And, uh, and, and my friend Bob, Bob spoke, Bob is white. I was the guy in the middle. I'm the black guy. And so the guy came up, he said, I'm, he said, I'm the brown guy. Well, I came up, I said, I'm the black guy. And I said, actually not black. I'm actually pecan tan with a pinch of cinnamon, but you can call it nutmeg. Uh, but what they could see, they saw this diversity. And we were all able to say, that's my brother. And, and, and we may speak different languages. We may look different, but we're one body. We may meet in different places, but we're one church. See, oftentimes when we think of church, we think of a church like Anistown. But see, the church, that's a, this is a local church. 
there's what is called the body. Sometimes it's also called the universal church. Every believer is part of the universal church. Some have transitioned physically and went on. They're part of the universal church. S some have yet to be born, and they're going to give their life to Christ. They will become part of the same church that you and I are part of. That's the universal church. That's the body of Christ. We're all one body. Also, in addition to that, we are all members of the body. We're all members. N no one, if you accept the Christ, you're not an outsider to the body of Christ. You're not earning your way in. If you accepted Christ, you are saved. There's no such thing as I'm halfway in, I'm halfway out. You cannot stand on the fence with God because you cannot stand before God and God says, where do you stand? Well, I stand in the middle. No, you don't because there's no in-between with heaven and hell. You, you either are in a relationship with Christ or you're not in a relationship with Christ. You're either a member or you're not. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You're either a sheep or you're a goat. It's that simple. We're all also different from one another. That's what he's also saying here. We are different. Diversity is to be appreciated. I don't have to be like you. You don't have to be like me. We don't have to be like the person to the left or the right. Diversity should be welcomed in the church. It's a blessing to the church. It adds to the church. It's almost like someone says, I want to get healthy. I need to start eating a healthy diet. Well, if you want to get healthy, you cannot only eat from the fruit uh, category apples. If you want to get healthy eating fruit, you cannot only eat an orange. You cannot only eat a banana. They all provide different things. So if you want potassium, you're going to have to go to another fruit. If you want vitamin C, you're going to have to take this fruit. I'm not saying one doesn't have a little bit of the other, but they all offer something that the other one does not. If you really want to have a fruit bowl, I guess what I'm trying to tell you, all if you really want to enjoy a fruit salad, you got to welcome the different types of fruit inside of the bowl. Some churches struggle with this. It's the reason why uh, in many churches they're separated by ethnicities and by races because they don't and can't appreciate the diversity that Jesus welcomes into the body of Christ. It's one of the reasons why Dr. King said years ago that Sunday is the most divided, separated time of the week in America. Did you know that if you're born in Africa and you're uh, Chinese or you're black or you're white, guess what they call you? African. We have more categories in the United States and for the last few decades, tension been rising and rising and rising and we think we have to separate and break things down in categories and if you're not careful uh, you could end up having a Hispanic Anistown church you could have a black Anistown church a white Anistown church that's none of, none of that's the Bible appreciate diversity not just in races not just in ethnicities, not only in speech, not only just in our education, not only in our financial sta status or our social status, but also when it comes to our gifts. See, diversity is to be welcome, but understand that being united does not mean to be uniform. We're united, but we don't have to be uniform. And so understanding that we belong to one body and that we're diverse, Paul really lays it out. Paul says, listen, God has given us all different types of purposes. He has given us all different types of gifts. And he names about six or seven different gifts here. Now, I want you to bear in mind that what these gifts I'm about to share with you, they're not exhaustive of all of the gifts that the body of Christ has. In fact, there's a great number of gifts that everyone in this room, you're going to hear, has a gift. But he's going to share six or seven of these gifts. If you want to look at some more of these gifts, go to like 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Or go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Or Ephesians chapter 4. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter 4, or Ephesians chapter 4. And you can hear, discover more gifts. But he names a few of the gifts. He says, if one has the gift of prophecy, that today means the gift of preaching or proclaiming. It's one who communicates the gospel. 
I'm a preacher. I love to communicate. But guess what? I'm not the only preacher in this room. I'm not the only one called to proclaim the gospel. In fact, this room, if you're a believer, you have been called to proclaim the gospel. You're called to share the good news with other people. It's a gift that God has given you. You may say, well, I don't know a lot of scriptures. I don't know systematic theology. I don't know what harmony theology means. Listen, you don't need to know all that stuff. There are some things you need to know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You definitely need to know John 3.16, but you need to know not only that for the outward, you need to know how that actually impacts you personally so you can relate it to other people. That is a gift. Also, there is the gift of ministry. It's all, it, it means the gift of serving. There are so many people in this room that have the gift of serving. It's when this gift is used by, now now listen, I know everyone in here says, I serve, I serve, I serve. But some people serve without looking for anything in return. You don't have to pay me. You don't have to mention my name. Let me just stand behind the curtain and do something for someone else. Let, 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 let me just let me just serve of the people. And in fact, when I serve, you don't even have to give me the best. I don't need the leadership position. And, and, and you don't have to even give me the cleanest, most uh, respectable job that other people think of. I'll take the lowest considered job to serve other people. What if you, were in, if you were in heaven and God asked you, would you be willing to just sweep by the door? Just, just keep it sweet. Would you be satisfied? Some of us say, I don't want that job. You've missed already over the fact that you made it to heaven. Now, we can give you a promotion, but we're going to have to send you to a different place. <laughs> but but you, 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 listen, serving is a great gift to serve other people. And it's not restricted to when you get to church. You use this gift at work. You use this gift at the store. You use this gift and your community. It's this gift that when you're walking out the store and you see uh, a, a, a lady or someone who's older and they're pushing their buggy and you notice that there are some items in their buggy like uh, a 32 pack of water and whatnot and you see them going to that car. It's that gift that drives you to say, excuse me, sir, ma'am, do you mind if I lift these items? Now, you might want to introduce yourself first. Something like that. <laughs> But it's that gift, it drives you, and it doesn't matter if no one else is looking, nor do you go back inside the store and say, someone needs to come out here and help them. You are that someone. That's the gift of teaching. This gift has to do with instructing. See, I can't help but to teach. I like to teach, but i never forget my, the first pa- my pastor my, uh, and the first one I served on staff with. It, it, it's, that's a strong, strong gift of his. And so... He was teaching me early on how to uh, prepare the baptism pool. And we would go, uh, he he would say, you got to fill up the water. And he's a teacher, everything, he would say, the the water has to be up to this height. Now, he had already told me how to do everything in his office. We sat down. Then he said, let's walk over to the sanctuary. We walked to the sanctuary. He got down in the pool. He said, the water needs to stop here. Because when two people get inside, the water's going to rise here. Now, some of you may be saying, man, can you figure that out? I can figure it out, but he's a teacher. And then he says, now, what you got to do now is fill the pool up. Make sure it's filled up with water. Make sure the plug is tight. It got the thing on the side like a tub, but also make sure the cork is down there because sometimes the water will leak out. And then he said, now, what you need to do is go over here. We went out. He said, turn the pump on. He said, get the water circulated. He said, now once the pump is on, he said, wait about 15 seconds. He said, and turn the heater on. He said, now do not turn the heater on before turning on the pump because you'll burn out the coils. You got to turn the pump on first. And then we went back to his office. And guess what he did when he got to his office? He had it all in writing to put in my hand. Now, I heard him the first time, and then he showed me. But just in case I didn't hear him well or I couldn't see well, he says, here, now take this with you and memorize it. Now, 
He's a teacher. Some of us just have that in us. We just can't say something. We have to explain it. That's the gift of instruction. But that's the gift of exhorting. That's the gift of building people up. That's the gift of encouragement. I know that there are several people in this church that have that gift. In fact, there are some people who are sitting here today that have not served, that have not given, that have not preached, that has not uh, taught, that has not done a number of things. The reason why they haven't done those things is because the person who has the gift of exhorting or, the, uh, or who has the gift of building up has not built this person up. See, some people won't take off until someone tells them that you have it. God has given you the ability and the gift to actually take off. Some birds don't know they can fly until they see another bird fly. Some birds don't fly until another bird tells them, let me show you how to do it. You can do it and cheer that person on. But there's also the gift of giving. This is the gift of sharing. This is a person who gives of their time, their talent, and their treasure regularly. They don't hold back. And sometimes we wonder, how can a person be so generous and still have? That's because some people are so generous, so giving, God has made this a gift to them that God says, listen, you keep on giving to them and I'll keep on giving to you. I'm going to make you not a reservoir. I'm going to make you a river. You bless those and I'll bless you to be a blessing to others. Sometimes we don't have what we desire to have because God knows we're not going to give to anyone else. We're not going to do for anyone else. What we're asking God to do for us is for us. I'm going to move on. Uh, leading. The gift of leading. This is the gift of shepherding. Caring for other people. Making sure that they are provided for. Making sure that they are protected. It not only refers to a pastor or a teacher in this context, but it may uh, uh, mention to someone who is actually giving care to someone who is uh, shut in. I'm going to make sure that this person is okay. I'm going to make sure that this person is protected. I'm going to make sure that they have food to eat. I'm going to make sure things are put in this place. I'm going to lead. Leaders lead. And leaders don't always lead people where they want to go. In fact, most of the time, they don't lead people where they want to go. In fact, they lead people where they need to go. A leader sometimes has to say, I'm not listening to you, but I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you, God, because 99% of the people will sometimes disagree with the leader. It doesn't mean that what God told the leader is wrong. See, you don't need confirmation from people when it comes to what God told you now. Now, I didn't say it's going to be comfortable. I didn't say it was going to be easy. You may, get, you may get hurt along the way. Your feelings may get hurt. But as a leader, leaders lead. But there's also the gift of showing mercy. This is, a, this is the gift of loving. I love how Paul gets right here because I feel like I believe this is what our church is about loving people. It's the gift of showing mercy, being kind to people. And this is about doing for others, even when others don't do for you. It's about loving someone who would never love you back. It, 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 it's, it's, it's really loving on folks who don't, won't never appreciate you. And I know that they have these different levels of uh, uh, people when they say, I, I'm, a, I'm a people person. You know when people say, I'm a people person? You don't want to just stop at a people person. A people person can talk to anyone. But a lover of people will talk to people who won't even talk to them. Who will never care about them. But guess what? What you do to me can't stop me from doing right by you. That's a love of people. Loving, love people even when they don't love you back. Could you love someone who actually talks about you? Can you love someone when they see you, they roll their eyes at you? Can you love someone who when you ask them for help, they refuse to give you help even though they saw you at the lowest of life? Can you love that person? Can you love someone who has told you to your faith they don't care about you, they don't love you? Could you love someone if they spiritually spit at you? Could you love someone who doesn't love you back? It's easy to love folks who love you. Love. He says, these are things, these are gifts that God has given to the church. 
I'm telling you, if that person with the gift of love will utilize that gift, it becomes contagious. I can't explain it. I'll, 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 I'll close with this. It, it, it becomes contagious. Have you ever been to a restaurant? Maybe it's the drive through Maybe you're sitting down. But man, you could pick up really quick that the person at the drive through window of the, uh, of the person serving you was in a bad mood that day. They were rude. They were short with you. They were nasty. And all you wanted was something to eat. But they were rude to you. But you kept on loving on this person. You didn't give back to them what they gave to you. Now, you didn't know what was going on with their life or what was going on in their world. But you didn't give it back to them. And after a while, you broke some ice. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone where they started off rude, nasty, it was, uh, but you just stayed a certain way? And it changed the momentum of the conversation. The, the, the feeling in the room changed. You, you brought the temperature back down to where it ought to be. But if you had given back to them what they were giving to you, the whole thing would have escalated. And on top of that, most likely when the person left from being a nuisance to you, from being ugly to you, from being cruel to you, most likely they would have took that to the next person. But guess what? If you had given it back to them, guess what you would have done? You would have raised your own temperament. And you would have left there and you would have gave it to someone else too. But because you flipped the script, so to speak, both of you left there and you were more kind, you were more generous, you were more loving to the next person you met. Isn't it a shame that you go to a drive through window and you get all worked up and then you come home and you speak ill or, uh, to your kids or to your wife and people don't even understand where it came from, but you picked it up at Wendy's or Burger King or Chick-fil-A or wherever, you picked it up along the way. Instead of picking that mess up, be loving, be kind. Show mercy even where mercy is not shown to you. You're not really that merciful if someone has to give it back to you. Paul says this. It's the least thing that we should do. Out of all that God has done for us. Remember where we start? This is at the bare minimum that we could do. Because we're all just passing through. And no matter how someone treats you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what hurt you feel... You're just passing through. And so the least we can do along the way, because everything we go through is temporary, is actually be loyal, committed to the one who actually put us in a permanent position of hope and giving us a future. And that's none other than God himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, dear Lord, for your people. Thank you so much, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray right now that you would open our minds, open up our hearts, dear Lord, to recognize where we stand in this particular area because we really want to please you, Lord. We want to honor you with this life that you have given us. Lord, help us to be a living sacrifice to you so that the world may know that you are who you are. You are the God of all. You love all. You have called man into a relationship with you and though man may reject you Lord Lord you still reach out to him you still demonstrate your love towards him so Lord help us to be objects to be vessels dear Lord of your mercy of your kindness of your grace by serving other people by encouraging other people by standing in the gap for other people Lord make it so it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray amen now, 